I'm Marcia McNutt, president of the National Academy of Sciences. I've got Victor Zhao down here in the front row, president of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, together, we'd like to welcome you to the National Academy of Sciences and to this special celebration of the 2018 Nobel and Kavli laureates. So the pursuit of science is highly rewarding. It's often painstaking. And the road to a big breakthrough is paved with lots of hard work. There can be uh, false starts, frustrations, and even dead ends. But the scientists we're celebrating tonight are truly our pioneers. They had the vision and fortitude to overcome setbacks and drive their research to new and unexpected discoveries. In physics and astrophysics and medicine and neuroscience, in chemistry and nanoscience, and in the economic sciences. We are honored that they will be sharing their insights and wisdom with us tonight. They have dedicated many years to achieve these accomplishments, and as a result, all of the sciences have benefited, and I would venture to say, all of society. But even more important, if history is our guide, um, all, of, all humans will benefit. Just about every aspect of our daily lives has been made better by science. From the food we eat, to the air we breathe, the medicines that keep us healthy, to our ability to connect with people all over the globe. Science has taken us to the outer reaches of our solar system and to the innermost workings of our DNA, helping us to understand what makes us uniquely human. Here in the US, our strong research enterprise has been the foundation for decades of national prosperity and security. New discoveries have created millions of new jobs and lifted generations of Americans. Earlier today, members of Congress from both parties joined us in celebrating the laureates on Capitol Hill. It was a powerful reminder of the steady bipartisan support for science and research here in Washington and across the country. I have no doubt that our research system will continue to create progress and opportunity for generations to come, and we will have many more outstanding scientists to honor in years to come. But now let us turn to this distinguished panel of laureates. Our moderator this evening is Mariette Di Cristina. She is Director of Editorial and Publishing for Nature Research Magazines, overseeing the global editorial teams for Nature Magazine, Partnership in Custom Media, and Scientific American, for which she also serves as Editor-in-Chief. Please give her a warm welcome. The drive to answer the biggest questions in science plays a key role in advancing discovery and knowledge. Basic research can lead to evidence-based solutions that can improve human welfare and help address some of society's most pressing challenges, as we've heard today. Tonight's conversation will explore the frontiers of human inquiry with 10 Nobel and Kavli laureates. On stage, we've organized the Nobel and Kavli laureate panel by field of science, which you can also see reflected on the screen behind me. At the far left, you will see laureates in physics, Nobel, and astrophysics, Kavli. At left, medicine and, or physiology, Nobel, and neuroscience, Kavli. To the right of me, chemistry, Nobel, and nanosciences, Kavli. At far right, economic sciences, Nobel. During the panel, I will ask a question of members of each scientific group, and I will introduce those laureates at the same time as I ask that question. If there's time at the end, I will take one or two questions from the audience, and I hope we'll be able to do that. Let's start with physics and astrophysics. Arthur Ashkin is retired member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories and won the 2018 Nobel Prize for the invention of optical tweezers that grab particles, atoms, molecules, and living cells with their laser beam fingers. Beside him, Dr. Rainier Weiss is Professor of Physics Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 2016 Kavli Prize Laureate in Astrophysics, and 2017 Nobel Prize Laureate in Physics for his fundamental contributions to the laser interferometric technique that allowed LIGO to detect gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time that occur when objects with mass accelerate. 
my question to both of you is, do we need ever more large and powerful scientific instruments to move physics forward? Or can creative minds alone tackle still unanswered questions? Did you hear that? Can no. You, okay. Do you need ever to grow the size of science to make significant steps? Or can you do it with thinking too? That's what she wants to know the answer to. Do you want it right now? Go no. right ahead. <laughs> I have trouble hearing, yes, so he's my Yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry the, about the acoustics. And I have three minutes. Look, I, I assume that you uh, consider me small science. I started out as small science. I was interested in science when I was 10 years old. I talk in, my, uh, in many of the uh, speeches about uh, radiometers and so on. But small science turned into large science. Once it became popular, other people picked it up. People I didn't even know, but did marvelous things with it. For instance, uh, uh, all the work of Steve Block in the genetic code. So that was small science, originally then turned into large science. He started with, uh, I think, small science and ended up with large science. And the, but I'll let him talk for himself. Um, <clears throat> what can I tell you? I've had one hell of a nice time. Um, uh, I have more to say about uh, um, science. Uh, um, other problems. I'm I'm trying to solve the uh, problem of solar energy. Now, not I don't know how many people know that I've worked for ten years on solar energy. I thought I had plenty of time, but I read from the New York Times that we are in a desperate state right now, and uh, it's questionable about whether or not uh, we've hit a tipping point. If we've had a tipping point, it's very bad. Am I at the end of my three minutes? I have one minute. <laughs> Got about another minute to go. Another have minute one. to go. If you want, you don't have to use it all. But... <laughs> well. What can I say? Wait until I'm writing a paper on solar energy. That will appear, uh, appear shortly. And then there are some original other ideas. I like to work on science uh, ever since I was a kid, and I still do it. When I make, I work on solar concentrators. My wife looks at these and says, Another solar concentrate? <laughs> the, the garage is filled with them? The cellar is filled with them? And I say, Arlene, they're all different. She said, they look alike to me. <laughs> I hope to learn more. Oh, and another thing. Uh, I, my, my career was not uh, made in heaven. Bell Labs was not a heaven to me. I was almost fired when I was hired. I was told to cancel noise. It's impossible to cancel noise. <laughs> I didn't know it. Okay. The guy who did it, let me just say that the guy who invented canceling noise was actually transferring noise from one frequency to another. That you can do, OK? <laughs> And in that sense, if you use a narrow bandwidth, then you've canceled noise. And I did it myself, but only later, OK? Thank you. I'm sorry. I think That's we'll need to it. move on. I'm sorry about <laughs> you that. You did good. <laughs> but I was concerned about canceling noise. Thank you. Thank you. So you want me to say something, huh? If you'd like. OK. Uh, this gentleman is 96, you say? Yes. Uh, ama amazing. OK. Amazing. First of all, uh, I don't like the question that was asked. I'll tell you that right off. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's ways of thinking about science that's big science or little science. But before I start on that, I want to say 
I certainly have lived in my life in the transformation, as he said, from something on a tabletop to something quite large. But the thing I want to tell you is that the, the thing that really made it work was something really quite amazing. It's called the National Science Foundation. And it's not just an advertising for them, but they did something which is most unusual. <clears throat> they listened to a kook like me and said, yeah, you can measure 10 to the minus 18 meters. Yes, you can do it. Yes, there are sources of gravitational waves out there. We couldn't really tell them what they were. Maybe supernova. That isn't much, but anyway, that with a very bad beginning, not knowing the technology, how well the technology would work, and not knowing what the sources were, would be even if you got it to work. The NSF, for f almost 50 years, supported a program to look for gravitational waves. And they succeeded. And I, what I want to really point out to people is that that was an enormous gamble they took. I mean, in other words, Proxmire didn't go after them. And so they could have had other scientists go after them. And what happened is that nevertheless, the, and the lesson that we should all get from that is that a little bit of the science budget in all the agencies should always be dedicated to things that are risky. Not all of it, you don't want to do that, but things that are speculative and interesting should they work. And that was the real key that I got out of the NSF. Now, now we're in the situation, let me quickly tell you in the remaining minute or so, why we're in big science, and unfortunately now we have to push it harder. Why is that? Because we now discovered what are the sources of gravitational waves. We now know that there are black holes and pairs out there. We know that neutron stars collide with each other. These things we didn't know when we started this all. And now it turns out if you want to really exploit the things that have been discovered and the investment that has already been made, we have to go into a system that lets us look at the entire universe in that field. In other words, look at all of the black hole pairs, look at all the neutron, because from that we can start doing cosmology, we can also learn where they come from. And that will absolutely change the character of the way we do astronomy. And the National Science Foundation has continued, and they have a fancy word for it now, they call it multi-messenger astronomy. And you'll find out that's one of the line items in their budget. And we're very pleased that's there. But it requires, and unfortunately, it requires a further investment. And it's not because we want to be bigger. It's just that to do the science, and this is the thing where I argue with big science versus little science, in order to get the science you want done, unfortunately, you have to bigger, bigger thing. It's not that there's another way to do it. The science is driving the thing that it be bigger. It's not that you want it to be bigger. You understand? That's the particular thing I want to make. It's not that I know people who want big things. I know the Chinese want big things, but not necessarily for good scientific reasons. But here, there's a wonderful scientific reason. And, you want, and they, unfortunately, the only way you can get at it is by making the thing longer, as much by 10 times longer than what we have. And that then adds all sorts of new science. So this is one of these stories where the thing is driven by the science to become bigger. That's the best I can do for your question. Thank you so much. <laughs> now let's turn to neuroscience. Robert Fediplace is professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and 2018 Kavli Prize laureate in neuroscience. His pioneering experiments revealed that cells are organized along the cochlea in a pattern that reflects their frequency of activity. A. James Hutzman is F. M. Kirby professor the Rockefeller University and 2018 Kavli Prize laureate in neuroscience. He discovered how sound signals are amplified within the inner ear and generate electrical responses that allow us to hear. My question for you both is, considering the frontiers of hearing loss and restoration today, can deafness be overcome? So we've conspired to use our six minutes in something more of a conversation. Uh, and I'm going to start by just posing what the issue is. <clears throat> it, it's the truth for all of our senses that they are there to convert physical energy in the surrounding world into electrical responses, which are the common currency that the nervous system uses. So our eyes and the photoreceptors there have to convert light into electricity. Our ears similarly have to convert mechanical vibrations in the, ear, uh, in the air into uh, electrical responses. And the way this is done is there are so-called hair cells. 
It's a terrible misnomer because it has nothing to do with the kind of hair that I'm missing. But it, it, these cells have little microscopic bristles, about 100 of them. And on the top of each cell, these bristles vibrate back and forth in response to sound. That sets up an electrical signal that then goes down a nerve fiber and into the brain. And the real question then is, what happens with these as they de degenerate? We lose them owing to loud sounds. We lose them owing to certain legitimate drugs. We lose them just with aging. And what can be done to repair them so that we can restore hearing? Robert. Um, well, I mean, there are two aspects to this. I mean, one is that, in fact, you could try and regrow them. If you do, all hearing loss is almost all hearing loss is due to death of the hair cells or lack of formation of them in the first place. So you could you could you could get new hair cells and put new hair cells in. Now. Uh, Currently, that's really not feasible in, in humans or in, probably in other mammals. It's not possible. Uh, you could actually... Um, I mean, there are methods to, to, to encourage them to regenerate, and there are ways of making hair cells de novo using st from stem cells, but neither of these have been sufficiently successful to get hair cells that are good enough to put into the cochlea and to connect up to the, to the nerves... Uh, that, that, are, that are needed, and um, we need to understand the, 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 the operation of the cells, how, how, they, how they transduce, how, and how they develop in, in order to address this question, but currently it's not feasible. Now, on the horizon, there's the possibility that you could take defective genes and replace them with new genes in, in viruses, embedded in viruses, and this has been successful in, 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 in mice to a limited extent. And um, there's a company in Boston that's invested heavily in this approach. But again, applying it to humans is really not possible uh, at this stage, mainly because the cells along the cochlea are all different. And you've not got to just generate a, a generic hair cell. You've actually got to generate one that's specific for each place. It has the specific properties which differ along the organ and, and will connect up to the nerve fibers. Now, do you want to, do you want to say well, anything more? I'm a little more optimistic about this simply because the problems that Robert has mentioned pertain to mammals, including ourselves. And the situation is very different with other four-legged animals, tetrapods. So in amphibians, in reptiles, including birds, this regeneration is going on all the time, same in fish. And in fact, you can take a chicken to, you know, a Motley Crue concert or whatever, blast its ears, uh, and they will quite nicely regenerate, even with frequency-specific hair cells. They will reconnect, and the animal will be able to hear normally again. Um, I agree that there is an enormous challenge, and this is certainly something that won't <laughs> happen overnight in ourselves, but I don't think it's a hopeless task. And I think basically what many people are trying to do <clears throat> is to decode the signals that are sent as these hair cells develop, and by doing so, to recognize the signaling pathways that might be reactivated to recapitulate the original development and restore hair cells by that means. I mean, there's one, there's one other aspect to this, and, and that is you don't grow new hair cells. You try and figure out why the hair cells die in the first place under these different environmental conditions <coughs> that, that Jim mentioned. You know, you, you've got poisoning with streptomycin antibiotics. You've got loud sounds. You, you've got aging. These, these all cause death of the hair cells. And what's really interesting is it's the hair cells at one end of the cochlea that, that, that go first, so you lose high-frequency hearing. The cochlea is, 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 is stretched out. It's a tube that's like an acoustic prism that spatially separates the frequencies along its length and with high frequencies at one end and low frequencies at the other and intermediate frequencies along. There's a map a lot along this cochlea. And the cells all have different properties along this map. And in order to regenerate them, you've actually got to match them to the position. Now, if you could figure out why the high-frequency hair cells die first under all these circumstances, it might give you some clue about what to do uh, to at least to deal with, with, with noise and, and things like that. It might also give you some idea about why you can't uh, make, make new ones. Thank you. Thank you so much. My next two questions are addressed to laureates in medicine or physiology and also nanoscience and chemistry. 
James Allison is Vivian L. Smith Distinguished Chair in Immunology at the University of Texas Anderson Cancer Center and 2018 Nobel Prize Laureate in Medicine or Physiology. He's established an entirely new principle for cancer therapy by inhibiting proteins that dampen our immune response, unleashing our immune cells to attack tumors. Jennifer Dudna is Lee Kaixing Chancellor's Professor in Biomedical and Health at the University of California at Berkeley and 2018 Cavley Prize Laureate in Nanoscience for her discovery that CRISPR-Cas9 enzymes from bacteria that control microbial immunity could be used for programmable editing of genomes. My question for you both is, what barriers does nature still pose to using your techniques in a clinical setting? Well, I'll, I'll start and talk about what we did. It's been, people have dreamt since, actually, Paul Ehrlich in, in uh, 1906 proposed that the immune system could be used to treat cancer, but it's never been successfully done. And one of the reasons we found in the mid-1990s is there's a molecule called CTLA-4 whose job is to stop an immune response in the early stages to keep your immune system from destroying you. The, the, the whole thing is you've got, you know, millions of probably 100 million different T cells, and you've got to pick the ones that can recognize one specific thing, and then they've got to amplify themselves to give you hundreds of thousands of cells, and they've got to do it in a few days to get the soldiers out in the field. Um, but you've got to stop that at a point. And uh, it was really, um, and, and had the idea that um, this molecule we found called CTLA-4 works very early in the process and prevents a, a second signal called CTLA-4 that, that you need uh, sort of like the gas pedal uh, from working and, and stops a response. And I had the idea that if we just take the brakes off, we could let the T cells keep going until they destroy tumors. And it, and it, and it works quite well in, in a number of kinds of, t of cancer. In melanoma, for example, people that get a single treatment, uh, about 20% of them with, with, again, metastatic melanoma are alive 10 years and more after they're basically cured. I mean, these are durable responses that last for decades. Um, there are people that are almost 20 years out. Turns out, though, there's more than one. There's another molecule called PD-1 that was discovered uh, about seven years after we found CTLA-4. Um, and um, it also works in a fraction of, of patients. But when you put them together in melanoma, you can get 60% of patients responding. Uh, and again, it looks like that's going to last for 10 years as well. At least it's about four years now from the, from the randomized trial. Um, so the, the question that we, that we are facing now is, by the way, in melanoma, when we started this work, the median life expectancy after diagnosis was seven months. And now we've got 60% of people that are alive at least four years. But there are more of these checkpoints um, that were found that they're expressed in different kinds of cancer now. So we need to start getting wiser and looking into individual tumors and seeing what the array of them is, studying the landscape, and also getting smarter about how to combine chemotherapy and radiation uh, with these, because virtually um, nothing is really known in detail about how these other things affect the immune system. And um, so it's a matter of studying what goes on in tumors after they're treated and figuring out what happens and what doesn't happen so that we can design rational strategies for putting things together in the right way to get that 60% melanoma up to 100 if we can. Thank you. So I, I guess I would start by saying that the story of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing is a, a great story of small science, curiosity-driven science, that went in a very unexpected direction. So when my colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, and I teamed up to figure out how a bacterial immune system was functioning, we had no initial idea that we would uncover the activity of a protein that could be programmed trivially to cut DNA. But once we had that realization, then this became a powerful technology for all the DNA sequence in any cell or organism. And seven years down we are now from that original publication, and uh, this technology has been um, incredible across the, the field of biology, really, not only for biomedical applications, but also in agriculture and in microbiology. About you know what the barriers are to using it clinically, I think that you know some of the things that 
Jim mentioned in, in uh, camp immunotherapy apply here, where we have to figure out how we're going to get these gene editing molecules into the right tissues, how we're going to control the tissues once they're edited and the outcomes of, of editing, and, um, and of course, how we move forward responsibly with this technology to ensure that it's used in ways that will benefit people um, and not in ways that will cause harm. And this has been a, a, a big challenge in a way because uh, the, the, one of the beauties of the technology, but also a challenge or maybe a curse, maybe not, hopefully not, is, is that it's relatively easy to use. And that means that it's a democratizing tool. It puts in the hands of any scientist who, who is, has a little bit of training in molecular biology the ability to manipulate genomes. And, um, and so this is le leading to lots of thoughtful, I think, discussions about how this will be useful in the future. <coughs> and one final thought, and that is that I think about what the biggest world using genome editing in the, in the near term, it's probably not going to be in, in, in the clinic. It's probably going to be in agriculture and in synthetic uh, biology that you'll, you'll hear a little bit about from Francis Arnold. Thank you. <laughs> Let's stay with chemistry for the next question. Francis Arnold is Linus Pauling Professor of Chemical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology and 2018 Nobel Prize Laureate in Chemistry. She conducted the first directed evolution of enzymes, proteins that catalyze chemical reactions, with applications raising from pharmaceutical manufacturing to the production of renewable fuels. George Smith is Curator's Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and 2018 Nobel Prize Laureate in Chemistry. He developed an elegant method known as phage display, where a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria with its genes, can be used to evolve new proteins. The method has led to new pharmaceuticals. My question for you both is, how can the systems you've been developing help our planet, help our environment, and help us to live sustainably? Um, I would <laughs> just like to say that phage display also really um, developed out of small science, just like Jennifer said in the case of um, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, it, uh, it was also a, very much a community uh, effort. A, a whole scientific community made small steps, and it emerged from that, that kind of, of uh, science. Um, I think it is also, just as uh, Jennifer said, it's a democratizing or a, it's an egalitarian neighborhood in the scientific community because the technology is um, very, um, uh, not very challenging. It's actually the kind of basic microbiology that I learned in college uh, in 1962. Um, and so it's really accessible to a lot, lots of uh, people. It's also a technology that, um, that allows great, I think, it allows great um, uh, scope for the imagination of someone that's using it. And many different things have emerged from it. We, we have examples from medicine, such as the um, uh, antibody drug Humira, which has emerged from a phage display. Nothing to do with me. It's not my co-laureate. Uh, Greg Winter had a lot to do with that uh, technology. But also I have um, new materials, the f a phage particle, a, 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 that, vi that kind of virus that infects bacteria, um, can be a new kind of material. You can make, a, a f you can make phages that, are, that have new properties. For example, properties that are like antibodies. They, they're, they're, they're better uh, substitutes than antibodies for various kinds of, of uh, sensors. Um, and uh, so I, I think that this is a, um, I don't know, I, I think of it as a, as a uh, sort of an inspiration for uh, small science, science that is uh, free and open and publicly funded and, um, and can lead to things that we absolutely cannot anticipate in advance. Thank you. Well, 
Well, I, I'm an engineer. I've trained as an engineer. I have degrees in mechanical and chemical engineering. And some people claim that I practice chemistry without a license. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, I, I care about is how do we share the planet with all the other living things and have a planet that's worth living in while we cure disease and make our quality of life better? And it seems to me that this tremendously powerful algorithm of evolution that led to these very simple things that you use, but they're not simple, right? These machines that Jennifer discovered and the phage display system that you use are the products of four billion years of engineering work. An algorithm that works at all scales from molecules to whole ecosystems and that create complexity and that create the materials and create all of the lovely things in the biological world, we should learn how to use that algorithm to solve the biggest problems that we face. How do we house, fuel, feed, clothe 10 billion people? And it's the biological world that can do this because we're learning how to harness this four billion years worth of work. It's simple. It's simple when we learn how to write that. There's a very interesting article on the cover of The Economist called Synthetic Biology, you mentioned this. And this is where the future is going, is learning how to harness the biological world. The problem is no one knows how a sequence of DNA encodes a function. What sequence encodes Jennifer, we can only read it. No one can compose that. But we have the process of composing it, and that is called evolution. And by using that process, we can make these things that will help us live sustainably. Because who knows how to use renewable resources? The biological world does. Biology can take carbon dioxide from the environment and create living plants and nitrogen and simple starting materials and create complicated, useful things. So I'm hoping that we too will learn how to do that and use our science to do that. Thank you. Let's turn to economic sciences for my last question. William Nordhaus is Sterling Professor of Economics and Professor of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University and 2018 Nobel Prize Laureate in Economic Sciences for creating analytical and numerical models that describe the interplay between the economy and the climate and are used to examine the consequences of climate policy interventions such as emissions reductions and carbon pricing. Paul Romer is Professor of Economics at the New York University Stern School of Business and 2018 Nobel Prize Laureate in Econo Economic Sciences for demonstrating how knowledge can function as a driver of long-term economic growth, as well as how ideas are different to other goods and require specific conditions to thrive in a market. My question for you both is, how important are scientific discoveries for economic growth and sustained improvements in the quality of life? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think what I'd like to start with is the point that economic science, or economics as we call it, is a little different from other sciences. It has to fight many of the same battles for funding, to overcome ignorance, to understand phenomena. It also, because it's a social science, has to deal with the fact that many of their topics are ones that have political and social and economic impacts and therefore get engaged in the political arena. Uh, I often think that the real problems we face in economics are, it's not what we don't know, it's that so many things that we know are wrong. And so we are faced with ideas that are embedded, inherited ideas from the past, and that we need to overcome them. One of those that I think both uh, Paul and my work has uh, has dealt with is the idea that markets can handle the system, the economic system, that markets by themselves can deal with all the forces and can lead to efficient outcomes. 
And in two areas, one being climate change, the other being technology, uh, what our studies have, sh have uh, f found and shown, I think, is that that's not the case. Uh, so in thinking about this uh, phenomenon, I, I think back to two areas where, in my work at the academy, we've run into political problems. Uh, one I, I don't need to talk much about, which is our work on, on global warming, as it used to be called before it was sanitized as climate change, but in global warming, and the, the tools we need to solve that, which are, I think, basically carbon prices, of which carbon taxes are an example. But another example that goes back uh, further, and it might be surprising, is that when we started working on accounting for the environment, extending the GDP accounts to include environment, that also ran into a political buzzsaw. And actually, in 1994, the Congress directed the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which does our economic statistics, a fine statistical agency, to stop work on that. Uh, it was actually politicization of our economic accounts. So I think the, what uh, I look to as a way of dealing with these are institutions. I mentioned the National Academy, which has been, in both these two areas, climate change and economic accounting, has undertaken some really masterly reports. Uh, our institutions, our educational institutions, our funding institutions, in my case, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, um, our research uh, institutes, uh, such as YASA in Vienna, these are ones that have supported uh, work in, in my area. And I sometimes think we need to think of those as just as important in nurturing us as our individual brilliance. I think it's not a surprise that, that there are 10 people up here from the United States because we have the institutions to support and nurture science um, and we're very successful at it. The benefits from science, as they show up in our daily lives, are just enormous. And we spend a lot of our time in communicating with the public, trying to remind people of those, which is appropriate. But I want to try and argue that right now, science can do something for us, give us a kind of hope that goes beyond just those, those benefits. Now, I, there's, there's nobody who's got benefits as direct and as immediate as Jim. You know, when you can show there are people alive now because of the discovery you've made, that just, you know, that trumps everything. Most of us be create benefits in an indirect way, and they come in small steps, so they're harder to perceive. But Bill has this beautiful paper that measures a particular type of benefit, which is asking how much light in lumen hours can somebody get from an hour's worth of work? And roughly speaking, from, say, the beginning of the... Uh, the, Neolithic, uh, the Neolithic Revolution, up to, say, the time of the founding of the National Academy, that went up by a factor of 20. You know, people just, you know, bump into things, they discover things, so 20 times more light. But from the time of the founding of the Academy until now, it's gone up by a factor of 20,000. So one hour of work translates into 20,000 more lumen hours of light than it did just uh, in uh, the time this, this institution was founded. So those benefits are just huge, and we need to, and, and by the way, it's, it's the system of science that uh, made those very rapid ones possible, not just curiosity, not just random search. So there are huge benefits, but you know, right now I think there's more anxiety about how we're gonna interact with each other as people than there is about just can we keep having more material uh, benefits. And here I think science is maybe even more important because it's a very unusual community of people. It, it draws on people from all backgrounds, from all over the world, and unites us in a kind of a common purpose with a lot of variation and strategies in our work. And, and it's a community that gets an enormous about done. These benefits come from this relatively small group of people in, out of the worldwide population working to solve, solve problems. And we get things done because we insist on things like truth and honesty. And we can trust each other because of that ins insistence. And we welcome people in to that community if you're willing to live by those, uh, those norms. And we ask you to leave, or we don't pay any attention to you if you don't live by those norms. And, and the, the goal is really one of, of offering benefits that 
can be shared by everybody, everybody who's alive, even those yet un unborn. So if you think about kind of like the hope for humanity, science is a model of how we can, not just what we can accomplish, but it's like who we can be and how we can be with each other. And you know, if, if the world could understand that and work toward that model, we'd all be better off. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for your patience with the, uh, with the structure with this evening. The delightful benefit is we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. There are uh, two mics around. And if I could just ask you before you uh, maybe let us know who you are and tell us uh, which laureate or laureates you'd like to address your question to, please. Any hands up if you're... Okay, I have one. <laughs> um, people are, we've heard a little bit uh, about open science and open research, and it's a topic on a lot of people's minds, especially sharing data. Can you make any suggestions, because I know it's sometimes difficult to do that as well, but ultimately beneficial to, uh, to researchers, to how can we reward people who are practicing open science and open data? Uh, well, uh, I think, the country can invest more in, in uh, open science, which I think is valuable in its, it's valuable in its own right, even if it doesn't lead to some you know, very identifiable practical, practical benefit. And I think that, um, I, I think that we should not um, pretend that, uh, that, uh, that uh, commercialization is a way, is a, a fundamental way to create, um, uh, a, a, you know, open resource, imaginative, exploratory, dis uh, scientific discoveries and uh, and uh, te technological innovations. I, I, I think it just it, it's just so worthwhile uh, that I think that the that the country just is, should be investing in it. It's also a very green sort of thing to do. It just doesn't you make a lot. I don't know. We don't create a lot of carbon dioxide for the... <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the things that there's never enough recognition to go around, but recognition is one of the ways to, uh, to motivate people. And uh, there are areas like open source science, open source software development, which you operate without any official support and yet recognition amongst one's peers um, <coughs> is, is what keeps it going. I, I've actually been astonished at how successful open source has been in areas like operating systems. So, uh, you know, there'll be a limit to how much we can provide, but I think recognition, like these kinds of events, are part of how we kind of motivate everybody and signal to everyone that this is a pretty good life and, uh, you know, welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. I see a question in the front from Dr. McNutt. Thank you. So I have hopefully something that will not be too politically charged a question for whoever wants to take it. Um, you all have achieved uh, what are the most prestigious prizes in all of science. And some of you may have done the work that got you these prizes many years before. Now I know in Ray Weiss's case, your prize came very soon on the heels of the discovery, but in other cases, the work might have been done uh, much sooner. What do you think is the ideal time in a scientist's life to be recognized with a prize and how soon after you make a breathtaking discovery should you be rewarded with that prize? Uh, I can answer it. Uh, a, a month before you submit your next grant, that would be really good. Cool. <laughs> but I'm actually not serious about that because uh, I, I, I would, I would um, uh, second, what Paul was saying about uh, about what what's the reward we get in science, and I, I don't think it's money. 
it's certainly not primarily money, it's recognition. And it's not things like Nobel Prize and uh, Cavalier uh, Prize and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's being honored within your own community and not as someone special in the community, you're just an honored member of that community. I think that is what drives, uh, it, it, what's, it's what drives us. And I don't think we need the, the prize to do that. If there were no Nobel Prize, we, I think we'd both basically be behaving the same. <laughs> They would like to add. Well, I think it's important to remember that these prizes are not about you. Right? I'll, I'll say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that these prizes are given to science to highlight a human achievement that we all share. It goes to an individual that's part of the cult, but it's really, uh, I sit on prize committees and we know it'll be you this year and another person next year, but it's about bringing the science to p other people and having a chance that's the, to share that that's with the, the whole yeah. world. Yeah, I think that's really what I want to say. I, sim very similar to what you're saying. I think, look, winning the Nobel Prize was not something I wanted, to be honest with you, because I know that it's changed my life in ways I can't, can't do much about. I've become an ambassador for science, and I think that's what you're gonna find also. That's also true of the Kabli Prize. And the thing is that it, it interferes with your ability to do your own science. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're now gonna go around giving talks all over the place. But the, the, the salvation of that is, I think, and that's the one thing you have to do, I think, is you become, being an ambassador for science, I think that's now an obligation you have, at least for a while, it can't be forever. Uh, that you now go talk not just to uh, you know, your own colleagues, but you talk to kids. You talk in schools. And I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about grade schools and high schools because that's where the future is. And I, I, I love to do it. I tell you, the height of, of intellectual activity and curiosity in, high, in grade schools is sixth grade. And that's where the girls really are interested in what you want. They have more interest in the sciences, and something terrible happens to them later on, I, which I wish we could explain better. And, uh, but the thing is that that's the thing where I think you can have the biggest impact yeah, in our youth, and that I think that's an obligation we have. But it does cut into the science you're gonna do, and that's the, the Sturm und Drang that goes with this. I mean, it's, uh, you know. So I, I could've just been happy without the Nobel Prize. I would've continued doing what I did anyway, you know? <laughs> Could I, could I add one? I want to link up this question with the last one, which is um, about the strength of intellectual property rights and patent systems and the such. I think what, um, this, what we've seen in the last, oh, let's say, 30 years is a strengthening of our intellectual property rights, uh, particularly in the in, um, medical area, but in other areas as well, that those who have studied the patent system tell us. So one suggestion is that we should weaken the breadth and depth and strength of these intellectual property rights like patent systems and move toward more toward prize type systems, more type systems that give people, there could be monetary rewards, there could be non-monetary rewards. Uh, an example that's um, perhaps well known to people is the idea of giving a reward for finding a vaccine for malaria. So rather than uh, it being something that would be invented, patented, and then sold at perhaps a high price, it would be something where the prize, a prize would be given and then it would be something made available. So I think this is it's kind of, in, it, it links these two ideas because I think the reward system, whether it's a prize, a non-monetary prize, a non-monetary prize, I think that's very powerful. And it, it could be uh, used as a substitute for some of what are now the overly powerful intellectual property rights. We might have time for one last question. There's a gentleman over here. So this question is for Professor Dudna. This is Moon Choi from University of Missouri System. Obviously, CRISPR is a very powerful tool for genetics and biology research, but there are those who may question, especially with what happened with the Chinese faculty member using CRISPR technologies, that question the ethics of gene editing. How would you respond to uh, some comments to that effect? Well, I would point out that there's a very important difference between type of editing that was announced last November by He Jiankui in China, which 
involved making changes to the DNA of human embryos that were then implanted and resulted in the birth of twin girls where the DNA changes that were made become heritable. They're part of the, the, the DNA that gets passed on to future generations versus the vast majority of application of genome editing right now for clinical purposes that involves what we call somatic cell editing, meaning making changes to an individual, but not changes that become heritable. And so I would just point out that, you know, I think I and most of my colleagues are incredibly excited about the opportunities to use somatic cell editing to cure rare genetic diseases in individuals. And I think most of my colleagues feel that while there may be opportunities to use heritable gene editing in humans in the future, the time is not now. We need to be very cautious about that type of use and that we need to take a very firm stand about the kinds of requirements necessary for any future clinical use of germline editing. So well, um, there you have it for now, I think. We've, we've talked about small science and big, about taking risks, uh, gamble, big gamble, and staying the course, about the challenges of biological systems and improving people's lives and well-being. We talked about systems for democratizing tools of science, learning from billions of years of evolution to help address yeah. some of the biggest problems we face and the need for social sciences to help guide us when we're addressing <laughs> political, social, and economic impacts. And one of my favorite lessons, too, was whether, uh, whether we're 10 years old, like Dr. Ashkin was when he got started, or 96. I think we can say that science is, is, does something wonderful for all of us in its way. Can you all join me in one more round of applause for these distinguished people? Thank you.